At a time the world's economy is being trampled on, lives lost, families and their lineages gradually disappearing, leaders world over are striving to find solutions to the varying effects caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Forecasts from the African Development Bank reveals that Africa's economic growth will rebound in 2021. There will be challenges along the way, but we will overcome them. We must start to think of inclusive policies that will catalyze economic growth, revolutionize the way we do business, but most importantly, bequeath a better brand name to the next generation of Africans. Join me at the fourth edition of the Osasu Show Symposium, themed Rethinking Africa. Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. Time, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Place, virtually on www.tostvnetwork.com. Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of The Osasu Show. We show you a documentary prepared by TOS TV Network highlighting the rape culture here in Nigeria. We hear from activists and people who play a significant role in combating this heinous crime against the vulnerable population in our societies. Don't go anywhere, it promises to be a very educative episode. When 13-year-old Elizabeth Ochaya died after being raped for five years by her cousin, all she sought was better education. When 22-year-old 100-level student of University of Benin, Uwa Omozua, was raped and killed in a church, she couldn't defend herself from false allegations that she was having an affair with a pastor. When 18-year-old Barakat Belu was gang-raped and brutally murdered in Ibadan by armed robbers in a house, she felt home was a safe place. These chilling tales reign supreme with most largely untold of women and children who are raped daily in Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation. We live in a society in which violence is a rite of passage for women and girls in Nigeria. That there is no way you would grow up in this country as a girl uh, before the age of 18 and that you that you wouldn't suffer violence, that that's, that's a reality. That shouldn't be normal. I don't think any child should have to grow up with that kind of fear. We shouldn't be getting those kind of messages And so for me, I think that that is the hardest part for me. And that the fact that we have to tell these stories to get people to care. Why should we have to share horror stories of like six months old babies being raped? Or young girls being raped by teachers? Or a girl who just wanted an education and her home was too loud, so she went to church to study. She was raped and beaten, and she died from those injuries. Though the place of consent is reiterated, perpetrators of rape have sadly turned a deaf ear as they continue to take advantage of vulnerable women and children. I think the main reason why we're seeing a scourge in these cases of rape across the country is because people are getting away with it, basically. 
and until we have a situation where people know you can't commit acts of rape or sexual violence and you will not be caught and you will not face the consequences, it would continue. I know there's a lot of debate say, around now, say maybe it's just better reporting or people are more confident sharing those cases. But I will tell you this, for someone who has been working in this sector for over 15 years, what we are seeing is not just because people are reporting more. They are more inious, they are more grievous, and it's because people have been getting away with it for many years. There's already an established culture to the way we address these issues, you know, and then when rape victims, you know, come up to speak, you know, there's, there's really no capital punishment, so to say, you know, when the people, when um, people are apprehended, you know, for rape cases, there's really, sometimes if it is in the family circle, they sweep it under the carpet, possibly because they want to avoid embarrassment and all of that. Even the ones that are in the police custody or um, in the court, how many of them get justice at the end of the day? You know, sometimes the jurisdiction process takes a whole lot of time that the victim becomes too tired, you know, the emotional toll on the victim becomes too much that they will want to say, okay, I don't think I want to pursue this case anymore. There's lack of education for how parents should educate their family about rape. Let's even start from the bodies. There's lack of education there. When you come, go from the family, the families go to one place regularly all their lives. And that's either the churches or the mosques. What is happening there? Nobody is educating about it. Even in the Bible, there's stories about rape. There's stories about sexual harassment. There's stories about what should happen to people who rape others. Dina was raped at a young age and her brothers avenged her. Joseph was sexually harassed by Mrs. Potiphar and he was also falsely accused and he ended up in jail. So there's no service provision available for us in church. And when you move on to the society, that's even worse. In our schools, we're not talking about sex education because we don't think we should be talking about sex education. It's an unholy thing to talk about. 20 years on, and the story of veteran broadcaster Tokumba Ajayi, who committed suicide after being gang raped by robbers, is remembered like it was yesterday. Rape is a traumatic experience that impacted victims in a physical, psychological and sociological way, yet a deadly class of people exists known as rape apologists who find a twisted way to defend and accommodate the act when survivors share the ordeal. Um, when we're talking about rape apologists in our culture, for me it's always important and we have to go to the root cause. Where is it coming from? It's coming from rape culture. And social media is a part of our culture. So for me, when I hear, yeah, you know, rape apologies or social media, yeah, social media in a way amplifies it. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's also provided platforms for survivors and victims to share their stories. I've seen people think rapists come in the offense because a woman is dressed probably in, with mini skirt. Rape sometimes is motivated by lust or lustful desires. Women themselves are the, the ones that bring rape onto themselves. These are all fallacies. Under no condition should anyone in his or her right senses justify the crime of rape. Rape is a very serious crime and violation against any human being. So someone coming out boldly to say, yes, she wasn't dressed well, yes, she deserved it, of course will be punished. And I believe that the lawmakers would amend the law, you know, and um, to ensure that we, people like this and people like that, honestly, I'm also going to move that in addition to them being charged with the crime of, you know, of justification, they would also be subjected to some mental, you know, assessment. While in recent times, we have seen the Nigerian government take steps and actions towards curbing these gender-based violence against women. The clamor for more laws, implementation and relearning for the Nigerian police who are the first responders linger. Um, NAPTIP, um, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, 
is domiciled in NAPTIP. So yes, NAPTIP is the first place you ought to have come to to talk about it because we implement the VAP Act within the FCT. Um, now the VAP Act gives us the powers to arrest and prosecute um, offenders and to also rescue um, these children or the victims, because not all victims are children. We also have adults um, who are raped as well. Uh, we give them psychosocial support, and then we also um, empower them at the end of the day. Security and safety of people and property lies with the government. And the government has a responsibility to ensure that when cases of rape are reported, whether it's in the hospitals, in police stations, or brought to the attention of the authorities by whatever means, the first thing is for them to investigate. The second is to ensure that they are able to support the process. And this is where a lot of uh, governments are failing. I'm not happy with the way the Nigerian government is handling issues of violence against women and girls. Rape is just one factor of it. But in general, when we're talking about violence against women and girls, I really don't believe that the Nigerian government is prioritizing it. You know, and, and what happened is that this entire pandemic and COVID has revealed that, you know, they don't take it seriously. And for a country like Nigeria, where when we look at the, the, the data that we have, the little data <laughs> that we have, and you look at the Nigerian demographic and house of, um, survey, what you see is that between 2013 and 2018, that violence actually increased. Not all police station in the whole of the Federation can boast of a standard gender dex. But that is the ultimate goal. That is the ultimate ambition. But I can tell you that uh, well over 80% of the stations uh, and 100% of the state CIDs and 100% of the state command headquarters has got these facilities. And for us, this is a good, is, 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 um, that, 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 is substantial progress, looking at where we are coming from and where we want to go. And the trainings are ongoing. And other things we are doing is also, uh, part of other things we are doing include a strengthening of our collaboration and partnership with other agencies, because there are also other agencies that are saddled with some of the responsibilities. And so um, the National Agency for the Pro Prohibition in Trafficking in Persons, for example, we work very closely with them. We're also working very closely with the National Human Rights Commission, because sometimes some people, when they feel their right has been violated, uh, will send information across to them, and they will transmit those information to us for investigation. We're also working with a lot of NGOs that are focused on helping women, children, and those in vulnerable positions. And the Nigeria Police uh, has also, the Nigeria Police Force has also established a foundation uh, um, that that is currently under the management of the Force Medical uh, uh, Department, the Force Medical Unit. They are manned by our doctors. And then they provide both medical and uh, psychological support to victims of rape. According to a report from the United Nations and the World Health Organization, globally, one in ten girls will experience sexual assault and this increased violence has traditionally been viewed as a result of gender inequality. There are more reported cases of women being raped. That is not to say a lot of boys are not being raped. Um, it, it's all about reporting, because if you do not report, I mean, what are we going to be working with? Um, secondly, I think by the time we begin to balance the gender equality, um, things like this will be reduced to the barest minimum. For example, if we have 10 directors somewhere, eight of them are probably men, just two women. If you go to the assembly, for, for example, you find out that most of the House of Rep members are men. Majority, you have very few women as members of the House of Reps. You have very few female senators. Go back to the states. You have very few women as. I don't think we have any w female governor right now. We don't have even one female governor. And then for those who have uh, deputy governors, we have maybe one or two. We should start from that. If anybody is going to run, your running mate has to be a woman. And so on and so forth. Because when you begin to make the men realize that you are not superior to the women in any way, you went to school together, the women probably had better grades than you, and so on and so forth.
We've been talking a, a whole lot about the girl child, how we should develop the girl child, how we should empower the girl child. Fine, it's an imperative. I also feel that there is a gap in how we have also mentored, trained and developed the boy child. According to Ellie Whistle, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. Each of us can play a role in eradicating rape and gender-based violence against women. For those who are in the habit of raping, I just want to tell you to change your ways because um, ignorance is not an excuse. If we catch you, if we arrest you, we'll first take you to the psychiatric hospital for treatment if you claim that you are mad. We'll treat that madness and from the madness, we'll, we'll escort you to prison where you belong. You're really sick. You need to get help. I hope you don't want in jail. I want you to live the rest of your life to see what you have done to this young woman. And I hope that it begins to taunt you and haunt you. And then if you get to a point where you realize your mistakes, I hope you become the kind of person that will begin to counsel other people not to do the terrible crime that you did. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's tiring, it's heartbreaking, it is, it is, I'm enraged. So I think if this country, you know, wants to pretend that they're a country that believes in, in God, or that says they value the life of their children, then they need to do the work that is required to create safe spaces for children everywhere. We all have a role to play. Our parents have got roles to play. Our teachers in school, our religious leaders, uh, uh, and our political leaders. And so the entire socialization process should be activated to play a role. And then the media has got a role to play. As a matter of fact, I've also seen rape victims who say, Part of the reason why they don't want to report is because of the way these things are usually reported in the media. So we must work together, push together, and together, I believe, we will surmount um, this rising challenge of rape within our polity. That's it for today's program. Do follow us on social media at The Osasu Show, at TOS TV Network, at The Osasu Show Foundation, and at Osasu Ignatian on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To get involved with our foundation, which focuses primarily on women and girls, you can visit our website, www.theosasushowfoundation.org. To read our news on sustainable development and current affairs across Africa, visit our website, www.tostvnetwork.com. I'll see you soon. Same time, same place next week. Until then, keep washing your hands, practicing physical distancing, and staying safe. God bless you. At a time the world's economy is being trampled on, lives lost, families and their lineages gradually disappearing, leaders world over are striving to find solutions to the varying effects caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Forecasts from the African Development Bank reveals that Africa's economic growth will rebound in 2021. There will be challenges along the way, but we will overcome them. We must start to think of inclusive policies that will catalyze economic growth, revolutionize the way we do business, but most importantly, bequeath a better brand name to the next generation of Africans. Join me at the fourth edition of the Osasu Show Symposium, themed Rethinking Africa. Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. Time, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Place, virtually on www.tostvnetwork.com.